Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely. Before we begin this episode of How to Not Suck at Music, I do want to mention that I now have shirts for sale. So if you now want a, a copy of Pro Tip, make sure the synth and the vocals are in the same key or bass or the lick. I now have copies of those t-shirts in my Teespring store, so definitely go over there and check it out. Links are in the description. So yeah, let's do this, guys. Let's uh, let's learn how to not suck at music. So our first submission is a clip of a bass player improvising. His name is Argon Danay. He's a French subscriber and he wanted some tips on improvisation. So uh, let's uh, check that out, shall we? bunch of things I do want to talk about with this, but the first thing that jumps to mind is a phrase that my high school jazz band teacher taught us when she was first teaching us how to improvise. Keep it simple, stupid. And yes, it is an acronym for the word KISS. I'm not really quite sure what the correlation between the two concepts is, but keep it simple, stupid is a very important concept for the beginning improviser. You're really gonna wanna use all the really complicated scales and modes and arpeggios that you've been practicing, and I really don't blame you because those sorts of things are very seductive, but you don't have the ability yet to string them together. And because you don't have that ability, it's not gonna sound super cohesive. So if you just think keep it simple, stupid, you will have a much easier time stringing things together and making it sound like you meant to do it. And, you know, more specifically beyond keep it simple, stupid, I think that you need to have a little bit more responsibility to the subdivisions that you are using. In those really fast bits, right, when you're playing really quickly up and down the neck and it's fast and everything, it doesn't sound like you're really playing with the backing track. It sounds like you're just letting your fingers fly and it's because you're not really thinking in terms of the 16th notes that you are using. If you were to go and try and transcribe whatever it is that you just played, you probably wouldn't be able to do it very effectively because you're not really playing to the subdivision. You know, this kind of reminds me of this discussion that I had about five or six years ago when I was seeing a show live of this really amazing band with an amazing bass player who was really technically talented, but he really did not know how to lock in with the rest of the band. He was playing these complicated 16th note, like syncopated lines, but it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right at all. And Sean Crowder, the drummer for Sungazer, was sitting next to me and he said, you know, he's not responsible for the subdivisions that he's playing. He's not locked into the grid of everybody else. And so it sounds like he's just kind of like doing his own thing. It's not like part of the musical experience. And that's, I think, a little bit of what's happening here for you. How should you rectify this? Keep it simple, stupid. Play much simpler subdivisions and you're gonna have a lot better of a time locking in. I love Miss Bracky's advice because keep it simple, stupid applies for everything. Last year, I played this improvisation game with Ben Levin, the guitar player for Bent Knee. And basically the game was, well, I'm gonna play eighth notes while you play half notes and then every measure we're gonna switch. That I think would be a really useful exercise for you just to really hone in on a simple subdivision and learn to lock in with the rest of the band while you're playing that subdivision and ideas within that subdivision. When we practice improv improvisation, so much of our headspace is taken up by modes and scales and all the theoretical stuff, but that's not the actual improvisation itself. That's our palette. If we develop this really rich palette with all of these different harmonic colors on it, but we don't know how to actually paint the painting, which is the improvisation or the music that we are making, it doesn't really do us any good. Having a good rhythmic foundation with a strong and deep understanding of subdivision can help take that harmonic palette and translate it into a beautiful painting, if I was going to belabor this analogy even further than I have. so. Thank you so much for your submission. Let's take a look at the next one, which will be a composition from Matthew Pace. Thank you, Matthew. Let's check that out.
want to stop you real quick and talk a little bit about this motif, this do, 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 which is just an A minor arpeggio that you just keep repeating over and over and then kind of change things around it, change what the guitar is doing, change what the bass is doing. The reason why it's effective here is because we're in an odd rhythmic territory. We're using the time signature of nine, eight plus 10, eight. So it's like this 19, eight scheme that you have going on. That rhythm is a little unusual and kind of foreign to a lot of us. And so when we have this repetitive thing going on, our ears can latch onto it and let that guide us through the weird rhythmic territory. So I think that's very effective. There are a couple things that I would change, however, about this. And the first thing is the guitar voicings need to change. Root position dominant seventh chords are easy to play on a piano, but they are a real pain to play on guitar. If you're going to play that C7 on a guitar, it would look like this, which is a six fret span and no guitar player would like you if uh, you made them play that. So maybe try rewriting that voicing to something that guitar could actually play. It more or less looks like you copied and pasted the piano left hand onto the guitar staff. Now, the reason why this is important to mention is because of the section that happens beforehand. I like the rhythmic idea of the guitar and the piano going back and forth, but the way that you have the guitar beamed is a little bit problematic because you cannot see the pulse as the pianist plays it. This goes along with the idea that I was talking about for the last entry, where everybody in the band needs to be on the same subdivision and same pulse. The way that you have the melody written in the bar of 9-8 looks like it should be a grouping of two eighth notes plus two eighth notes plus two eighth notes plus three eighth notes. The way that you have it written, it looks very different for the guitar player. This way, even though it looks a little bit more complicated, would actually be a lot easier in practice because you can see where all of the subdivisions align with the melody. This might seem like splitting hairs, but the way that you write the music that you want to make is extremely important in saving time and money. When I was rehearsing one of my pieces for my senior recital at Berkeley, I think it was in like 13-8 or something really stupid like that, I wrote the subdivisions for the horns completely wrong and we wasted a whole lot of time rehearsing that we could have been spent playing and doing other things. I'll never forget what the Barry Sax player, Ben Whiting, told me after rehearsal. He said, the way that you wrote your rhythms makes my eyes bleed. It wasn't the fact that the rhythms were hard to play, it was that they were hard to read. The the clearer you are with your musical rhythms, the better a musical performance you will get from your musicians. That's an important lesson to learn. Anyway, I am intrigued with where you go with this. Let's listen to it just a little bit more. Okay, before we go any further, I do want to rewrite this bass line. So if you put this on my music stand, I would actually have a fighting shot of sight reading it down so that all the subdivisions actually matched up because as it was before, I, it just would be impossible for me to read and it would make my eyes bleed. But anyway, moving beyond that, I do like the fact that you are evolving this motif a little bit more. It's now not just an A minor arpeggio, it's now kind of a D minor arpeggio, but I feel like you could do a little bit more with it because you're kind of just repeating the same texture that you started with. Block chords in the left hand, minor arpeggio in the right hand. And the block chords don't really feel that much different than the block chords that you used beforehand, even though they are different. There's one chord in particular that I uh, kind of disagree with the choice, and that's the D minor in the third bar of this pattern. I don't know, there's not enough spice in there. You have a little bit of spice with all this other stuff, and I do like the spice, but it's so bland. It's so stark and so, so bland. And again, maybe this is a personal preference for harmony since harmony is so personal, but man, that D minor, I disagree with that. <laughs> Anyway, we've talked a fair amount about this piece of music, and unfortunately this format is not great for talking about long stretches of music because you go on for another couple minutes, so I'm gonna have to stop here, but I do like on a philosophical level what you're going for here, which is taking a simple motif and developing it. That usually yields for me personally uh, the most meaningful music, and that's kind of what I like to go for with my long scale compositions. So thank you for your submission. Let's go on and check out the next one, which is a submission from Alex Pilkovich. Uh, let's check out Alex.
there is one thing that I want you to take from my how to not suck at music videos, it's this. Keep a straight wrist. For the love of God, please keep a straight left hand wrist because then you'll actually have a career after 10 years and you won't injure yourself. If you play with a bend in the wrist, thinking that these stretched fingers will somehow give you a more proper classical technique, please think again because when I'm actually moving these fingers, you can see that the tendon in my forearm is moving up and down. And when I'm moving my fingers like this, especially if there's a lot of tension in the wrist, this tendon will rub up against the bones in the wrist. And this will cause eventually repetitive stress injuries. And it is very painful. If my wrist is straight, this tendon doesn't have anything to rub up against. So I have a reduced chance of injuring myself. Now, how do you actually get the straight wrist? Well, there's two things that I can suggest to you. One, point your thumb to the headstock and two, bring your elbow as close as you can to parallel with the fretboard. Those two little pieces of advice will get you so much further than you might think. They might also save you a lot of pain and the inability to play bass later on down the line. So please everybody, keep a straight wrist. Okay, rant over, but it's very important guys and I'm very passionate about making sure that nobody hurts themselves in the long run because it did happen to me and I wanna make sure it doesn't happen to other people. So let's check out the next submission which comes from Trey Campbell who is playing a Ray Brown transcription of an Oscar Peterson recording, Days of Wine and Roses. Let's check that out. The main thing that I think that you need to work on here is your rhythm. Your pulse is all over the place. You're rushing and dragging by the order of maybe 20 or 30 beats per minute every measure. You're playing all the notes correctly, but it doesn't really feel like Ray Brown is playing it because you don't really have that steady locked in groove. So definitely turn on the metronome and start practicing to the metronome. But more importantly than just practicing to the metronome, listen back because the listening back can give you more insight than any teacher will be able to give you. If you're listening critically, you'll be able to say, oh yes, I am rushing this phrase right here. I need to remember to pull back on that. Or maybe I'm dragging too much on that. I really need to push forward on this particular phrase. That symbiosis of recording something, listening back, and then teaching yourself what you did wrong is very powerful. It's also quite scary, and a lot of people hate doing it, myself included, because listening back to yourself is the worst thing for your ego. So definitely practice along with a metronome, and I think another good challenge for you would be to try and count to four along with playing your transcription. In other words, while you're playing, literally just count out loud, one, two, three, four, along with the quarter notes. I have a video called Improve Your Rhythm on doing this exact thing, and it's very difficult, but it's extremely useful. It's also, more importantly, a way of practicing without the metronome so that you can really internalize the pulse so that you don't have to rely upon the metronome when you're actually out there in the real world performing. That's what I think you really need to work on. And when you're an electric bass player switching to upright bass, you normally are gonna be worried about things like intonation or fingering or any sort of the physical aspects of playing the instrument but I think the big thing that separates people from being okay bass players to being amazing bass players is a strong sense of internal rhythm. The sooner that you attack this aspect of your playing, the better, because it will literally influence everything that you will ever play from now on. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in submitting something for a future episode of How To Not Suck At Music, please email me at howtonotsuckatmusic at gmail.com. Submission should include a video component and ideally should be less than two minutes long. Please don't send me large video files. Just upload it to YouTube and I can check it out there. If you enjoy what I do here on this channel, please consider joining my Patreon because I release bonus videos all the time for my Patreon patrons as a thank you for making this channel what it is. And yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Until next time. Peace.